I'm here to talk to you about my research in the Langston Hughes papers and about the photographs and materials he brought back from his trip to Soviet Central Asia. You can see that picture right there. This is from 1932 to 1933. Uh, much of my work has been translating the marginal notes and poems written by Central Asian writers for Hughes to trace the connections he had made there. Hughes is the first American poet to be translated into Uzbek and he is the first to translate an Uzbek poem into English. Uh, this photo is something I stumbled upon online while I was feeling lost in my PhD program. I was actually considering dropping out, but it's this photo that saved me. This was taken in Tashkent, 1933, and the sacred atmosphere of this photo made me want to find out the stories from this day and his time in, uh, in Central Asia. This curiosity has been the driving force of my scholarly work. If you see here, in the middle row, it's Hughes. Uh, next to him is, uh, to his, uh, the right of the photo is Ali Tokumbayov. Uh, there's Rafa Ghulam next to him, and then Shalik Kalaf, a Turkmen poet. And it seems like they're surrounded by um, Russian and European poets around him. Um, what ties me to this photo is that my family's migration story begins the same time period that Hughes was in Turkestan, then newly formed Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. My family came to Brooklyn by way of this Turkestani diaspora community, and we spoke in this older form of Uzbek or Turkic language. And like other exiled communities, this dated language was preserved under the glass bell of diaspora. It was also only spoken inside my home, so Uzbek was my kitchen language. I'd have never guessed that it would be the language that would open the door into this historical moment in Hughes's life and allow me to contextualize and resurrect connections he had made in his journey. But before I begin the story of Langston Hughes, most popularly known as a Harlem Renaissance poet and lesser known for his uh, translations and writings on Soviet Central Asia, I want to read Hughes's trip through the lens of a Sufi Islamic concept of Paiwandi it's in Persian, the word, or union by intertwining or connecting, as used in the work of the 10th century Central Asian philosopher Ibn Sina. You may know him as Avicenna. The word Paiwandi appears in the short Ibn Sina text, Treatise on Love, which explains divine love, ishq, or as I see it, radical love. According to Ibn Sina, when we make connections with other people, when we paiwand ourselves with others, we participate in an emanation of divine love. Harmony and a sacred atmosphere is created in these moments of connection and intertwining with each other. Hughes create, carries this ethos of ishq, or love for humanity, and especially for the other. It's at the core of his cosmopolitanism. It is through this love for making connections that Hughes spends with ease nine months in a part of the world where sometimes three different language translators are needed to bridge the distance between English and the Turkic language. Hughes's archives itself reminds me of this Paiwandi interconnectedness he felt with other people in the world. As soon as he reached Ashgabat in Turkmenistan, he immerses himself in the community. He leaves the government uh, authorized tour and uh, takes his own route and follows his intuition and travels this way with good faith in the world, I would say. And he builds a community around poetry. He connects with the same eagerness with Turkic poets, Russian writers, and with African-American engineers, architects, and agriculturalists who are also there to build the foundations of the cotton industry. When Hughes traveled, he wanted to map out a world that contrasted the vicious racism of Jim Crow, America. He created connections and unity, not in a way that obliterates difference or one that sugarcoats, but one that patches together, as in a quilt, the lives of those he met on his journey and, the, the, and he recorded the, the struggles that, he, that they went through. When he returned to the US, Hughes maintained the courage to preserve these archival notes and poems from Soviet Central Asia during the most dangerous years of the Red Scare and McCarthyism. In 1953, he testified at a trial to defend his work. And at the risk of his own safety, he sent this trunk full of diaries, photos, and notes from Soviet Central Asia to be archived at the Beinecke Library, uh, Beinecke Collection at, at Yale Library in the 1940s. Uh, it's this meticulous preparation of notes um, and dates that led me to the discovery of friendships that Hughes made along the way. 
In the Langston Hughes archives, a sacred atmosphere is created between Hughes, Hughes's handwritten notebooks, the scent of ink, the impression of his handwriting on the paper, and myself. I felt in the sacred atmosphere that my intuition was leading, and it was leading the research much in the same way that Hughes led his trip, uh, his adventures, uh, through intuition and through good faith. For Hughes, translation is an act of love. It is the way he intertwines with the world and takes the solitary self and makes it a multiplicity by translating and bringing with him the words and poems of the poets he meets. I'm going to read one poem that he translated from the Uzbek while he was there. And I would say he captures the cadences, um, even if there are three translators uh, that he worked with to translate this. It's called Old Uzbek Poem. I told her, charming, you must wear on the sugar of your wrists the circles of golden bracelets, for ornaments are an adornment good for a beauty. And she answered me with sweet coquetry, I'm afraid the web of my hands cannot stand the weight of gold. That's from the poem Charming. It was actually found in the notebooks. It wasn't, um, it hadn't been published in his time, and it's through the CUNY Lost and Found we were able to publish it. But to return to the story of Karim Ahmadi, an unknown Uzbek poet, but with several po photos in the Hughes archives, we need to return to January 1933, to the date of the studio photograph in Tashkent. Hughes reached a very cold and snowy Tashkent where he met the Uzbek poet Karim Ahmadi. Uh, we haven't come up to his photo yet. Um, so this is actually Shali Kekalov in the photo you see on the side and Arthur Kessler. Uh, but you'll see a repetition of one man's photo, and that's actually Karim Ahmadi. And I found out only through uh, a small note he had left for him. Um, I didn't find too much the first time I researched, but let me tell you the story of how I found um, found out more about their relationship. There were photos that I didn't find much about him, but on the last day of my fellowship, uh, on my way home on the Metro North, I fell asleep and had a chilling dream. It was Ahmadi, whose faces I had often seen among the photos in the archives, but he was now in person, sitting in the chair in front of me, weeping, Mane Unitma, Mane Unitma, don't forget me, in Uzbek. Uh, it made my heart jump to my throat, and it woke me up with a start. I stopped at the next station and returned to Yale while I still had the boxes out to look again. And somehow, filed under Karen Akhmadi, I found a nine-page long poem written in old Uzbek with Persio-Arabic script and a translation written on a separate online paper. Uh, nine pages of Karim Ahmadi's poetry had sat for all these years under the name of Karen. Poets were among the first victims of Sovietization and Russification in newly divided Soviet Central Asia. Many were imprisoned or sentenced to death, usually tried with their entire families to eliminate language loyalties and any hint of what, what was known as uh, ethnic chauvinism. Sovietization meant communicating in Latinized writing, which was later overturned for Cyrillic writing uh, much later after uh, Hughes's trip. Um, there's there's Kerry Mahmadi and Langston Hughes and another poet, unknown. Forgotten and expunged from history, now the poem written in an Uzbek alphabet that was banned, Kerry Mahmadi had written for Hughes, whether coded or romantic or one of hope, um, was, is a story of a momentary friendship. There were two versions of the translation, and I translated this with my father. Um, and they're both called... Um, the two versions are quite different. I'm going to read for you the version that was translated for Hughes, and then I'll read for you the version that my father and I translated. Listen to me, my dear Langston. To L.H. on his arrival in Uzbekistan. I greet your arrival, the hero man. Hey, you, who came across the ocean, the lion who conquered the waves of the sea. I am bound to you as tightly as the curls of your hair. And when I saw your eyes, I loved you. Welcome, you poor son of the West. When my eyes look into your lively laughing eyes, I see the suppression of your people. But when I see your smiling face, I raise my fist against the West. So that's the version that was uh, translated for Hughes, um, is written out in actually Hughes's handwriting. This one is what we translated, um, my father and I translated. Crossing many oceans you've come, leaving your family behind. I saw you and I felt wrapped in the curls of your hair. The black and white of you, a protective eye talisman, entered my poor home. 
When I look into your beautiful eyes, I love you. In front of your glowing face, your words come like stars, and now you must hold my words. I am powerless in the face of the Komsomol. I am hiding. And it stops there. So obviously there's two, um, there's some censorship happening before the translation, um, to keep the original translation. Um, I see my role as a scholar in Langston Hughes archives as a very small uh, contributor, uh, a bridge builder to contextualize Hughes's connections, to connect the moments where there are misconnections, like in this poem, and to resurrect vital overlooked works that Hughes collected but could not publish at the time. You see here Kerry Mahmadi in traditional Uzbek outfit, photographed with Hughes. Um, it's actually one of my favorite photos there. Uh, I finished my dissertation uh, at the Schomburg and oftentimes sat on the steps of Hughes's brownstone when I felt stuck. Uh, in many ways, this is also part of the, um, the concept of visiting or remembering um, a shrine. And for me, the Schomburg was a shrine for Hughes. Um, this is what Hughes had written uh, in his notes. And I think the next few photos would, would show that note. Um, how did I, a poor black American, get way down south in the union of socialist Soviet republics, way down in Tashkent, Bukhara, Merv, Samarkand, almost to the Indian border, almost to Western China? I sat in the courtyard, courtyard of Tamir Lane's tomb and wondered, am I dreaming? I can easily reverse the path of Hughes's journey and ask, how did I, a poor, then graduate student of Uzbek roots and Afghan birth, get here to Harlem, to New York? And just as Hughes felt a sacred connection at the tomb of Amir Timur, I felt the same spiritual connection, standing where Hughes's ashes are interred, beneath the floor medallion in the hall of the Schomburg. I feel at this moment that my scholarly work is really a chance at having a conversation with Hughes. And in this Paiwendi to Hughes interlink African American poetry, Uzbek, Turkmen, Uzbek poets, and see that um, and mark the moments where Hughes braided his own voice with the people lost to history. Uh, and only now can these voices be returned, alchemized by the spirit of Hughes. And that's my, my life's work. Thank you.